today if we have time and then we'll do a threaded rod example once we do the threaded rod example that is it for our first celebration okay after that we go straight into bolted connection land and bolted connections and welded connections are exam two okay exam three is columns and beams um, so uh, we're getting we're, that's actually going to be happening sooner rather than later in fact I'm going to pull up the schedule real quick uh, So here's our schedule, and I have that the first exam, oh, what's that? Yeah, that's next week. Um, now, yeah, so we'll review on Monday, have the exam on Wednesday, um, and we're a, maybe a tad behind because of the discussion we had on, on the bridge, although I think that was really good stuff. But threaded rod design is a pretty quick topic, so we'll, we'll get through that quickly. We'll definitely be uh, on track to rock and roll for the, for the first celebration. So... Just so everybody's aware on the schedule, we celebrate next Wednesday. So uh, review on Monday. So y'all know the drill with review. Come prepared, asking, ready to ask any questions you want. Um, open book exam. Uh, obviously, you got to use the manual. And um, uh, you all can bring a formula sheet and put whatever you want on it, except for worked out examples. So, uh, so yeah. Sound good? All right. Let's get into into it with block shear. Um, let's pull up. Now, um, let me go back to where we were. Okay, so here, here, here's where we were, here's where we left off. So we were looking at block shear, which was this really weird um, failure state. Um, the, the, the idea is that you have a combined failure in tension and in shear along a given failure path. So any term that's associated with shear has a 0.6 next to it. The 0.6 relating to that von Mises yield criterion, the idea that um, uh, the idea that uh, in normal stress, you yield when you hit FY, but in shear stress, you yield when you hit about 0.577 FY, and the spec says, ah, 0.6, close enough for government work, so they, they rounded up a bit. Um, now, remember, any time that you have an expression that looks like this, where you have a pile of junk less than or equal to another pile of junk, that's just saying it's the minimum of those two quantities, and when you take this expression and pull out everything that's common, you get what I have right here. So all this is is just rewriting uh, what's in the spec in a, in a format that's a bit more user friendly. Now whenever you use this, that this expression will give you the nominal capacity. Remember you must then adjust that by uh, the resistance factor to get the design capacity. And that's really easy to forget. It's like you do this big complex block shear problem and you forget to use speed. So don't forget to use speed. Um, and V is 0.75. Sound good? Now, um, whenever you're doing a block shear problem, first off, UBS, I'm going to tell you, for anything in this class, UBS is going to be one, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, the only time that it's non-uniform is when you have a coke beam with multiple rows of bolts, and we talked about that uh, 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 last time. And then, hold on. Now, this is kind of what I want to focus on today and make sure that everybody's crystal clear on this. Whenever you're doing block shear, much like with um, uh, much like with with uh, 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 net area, there's the possibility of multiple failure paths. Okay. Now, whenever you're um, looking at a block shear problem, I know this is going to sound like a weird example, but if you ever want to try and visualize um, what failure paths that you need to consider. The best way of doing that is the following, okay? Now, imagine that I have a plate. Okay, so let's say I have a plate, okay? 
and I'm yanking on it this way. Okay. Now let's say I've got you know one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. If you ever want to visualize the potential possible failure paths, and please don't criticize my, my artwork here, but I want to imagine, if we will, imagine that this was a sheet of paper. Imagine taking your thumb and sort of gripping this sheet of paper in such a fashion so, is that good? Come on laughing too much. Imagine gripping the sheet of paper in such a fashion that all of your that, that all of the bolts are sort of encapsulated by your thumb. Okay? And then now imagine ripping it and ask yourself if I pulled on that, like anybody have a like a scratch sheet of paper I can borrow. It doesn't have to be quantum paper. I don't want to that sounds expensive. <laughs> there we go, Mr. Mr. Minot, there we go. So you know imagine you know I've got this sheet of paper and I, and I grab it with my thumb and I rip. You know how like it sort of comes off like that? Okay, so ask yourself if this was a sheet of paper, how would that happen? Okay, well, there's a couple ways that that could happen. Let me sort of, you know, do this. So one way it could happen is you could sort of rip out that central part of the paper and sort of rip it this way and rip it that way. And then another way could be kind of like what happened here. Like, did you see what happened when I when I did that here and I ripped? I kind of ripped not only this way, but that way. So I could rip off sort of that corner. Does that make sense? And one way is always easier than the other, and that will make a lot of sense after we do this problem. Okay, so we're going to do the problem and then maybe revisit this and see why when you look at this plate, assuming that all the um, scale makes sense, you would always check the case on the right and not the left just by observation. But that will become clear here in a little bit. Does that sound good? If you understand that, then I want to look at this problem. Now this is example six. Um, if you look at this problem, this is actually the exact same problem that we did in example four. If you remember, example four was a W8 by 24 that was 40 foot long, and we analyzed this problem before. We looked at gross section yielding, and we looked at net section fracture, and we looked at slenderness. We didn't look at block shear at the time because we didn't know what that was, right? So that's what we're doing now is we're going to go back and we're going to assess this section's block shear capacity. Now, when we assess this section's block shear capacity, I want to keep in mind what we got from example four. When we did example four, we got a gross section yielding of 318.6. We got a net section fracture of 255.6. We have a slenderness of 298.1. So it met the slenderness requirement, and we knew what this is. What I want to do is I want to compute this section's block shear capacity, and I want to see how it compares to these. Like, is it lower than those? Is it higher than those? I have no idea. We have to go and check. It could be higher, could be lower, we'll see. Sound good? Now, let's look at this. I brought my little display with me today. Um, I'm going to erase everything I got here. Now, If I draw this out in three dimensions, three dimensions, right? What do I have? I've got a line of bolt on each side, two lines of bolts in each flange, and I got four bolts per line, right? So I got one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Something like that, right? Now, remember the thumb analogy? We'll do the same thing here, okay? So here's my I beam. So from looking at it like this, what do we got? Maybe something like one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Something like that, right? Now, because this stuff will smear, we'll use the other end. So, I need volunteers. You follow 
volunteers too. <laughs> There's only ten districts in West Virginia Day Rates. This is a district <laughs> well. All right. That was really cheesy and really bad. I apologize for that. That one deserved an apology. We're gonna add point one in the state counter just for that. Okay, so here's what you can imagine. Okay, so here's the connection, right? And so if you were to grab this flange using this analogy, what would you do? You sort of grab like that, and grab like that on each side? Like grab take this top flange and grab it like you would. Well then there's there's one or one over here and there's one over here, right? Yeah. Now, you're actually also missing some, right? Because these down here are bolted, right? Now, if I were... Oh. <laughs> My hands are slick. I, I'm just messing with you. So, if I were to yank on this, right? If I were to yank on it and rip part of this off, what would happen? Would it make sense... Let me go. Would it make sense... So, he's over here gripping. Would it make sense that maybe this entire sort of chunk right there would rip off like that. Does that, does that make sense? But it wouldn't be just this one. It would be that one. It would be you know, the one down here and the one down there, right? So there'd be four little chunks that would rip off that would separate that out, right? And once these pieces come off, like, like you, know, you grab this, right? Once those pieces come off, it's, it's done, right? So it, the way I'm going to handle this is I'm going to compute the capacity of a single one of those blocks, and I'm going to multiply by four to get the capacity for the whole shape. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. And then because I have it, I might as well pass it around. I'm going to pass this around so everybody can take a look at this. If you actually grab this like this and actually sort of bend it, you can see how it's a lot tougher to bend this way than it is that way. It's a lot easier to bend this way, and that's why... The RY and the IY is smaller, the I is smaller this way than it is that way. That's what we mean by print like strong axis and weak axis. Strong axis, weak axis. You can, I mean, try it out and see. So. All right. So I, I really wanted to kind of explain what I was about to draw before I drew it because it, 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 it behooves, you know, the problem to do that. Or behooves me. So, example six. Okay. So, what we've got is we have an I beam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of look at it like this. All right. So, here's that. I have hazel eyes. So, we'll use green. So I'm looking at it from the top down, okay? And so what I see is I'm, I'm going to see this. And if you look through, like if I look through here, there would sort of be like a dashed line right there. And that would be the web through that. Does that make sense? So there's the plate, and then there's the web right there. So that's kind of what I'm what I'm looking at. And what I'm going to see is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And I'm yanking on it like that. Okay. Now help me out with some dimensions because you've got the here. Let's let's be consistent. Here's the problem. So let's look at this. So help me out. What is this dimension right here? Four point five. One and a half inches. See, part of this exercise is making sure that you can look at the section in multiple dimensions and know what the what dimensions are what. So that's one and a half inches. Um, let's look here. That, 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 and that. All right. So what do we have? What's this lower one? Two. Two. And what are all the others? 
three. There we go. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look, we're going to investigate the capacity of a single block. So we're talking about a single block, and then we're going to multiply the capacity at the end by four. Okay? So we'll say four a single block, block, not block. Let's see if we can compute the capacities. Now here's our expression, and we need a bunch of areas and shear and tension and, and all sorts of stuff. Okay? Now, first thing we need to do is we need to identify which of these paths are in shear and which of them are in tension. So if here's my I section and I'm yanking on it like this, right? Here's my block and I'm yanking on it. I have to basically rip off here and here. Rip that long part and that little part. Now the long part, if I'm, if I'm pulling it like this and he's holding it like that, is the long path experiencing a shear force or a tension force? Shear. Shear. Okay? The little path is experiencing tension. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Thank you. So this right here, this is experiencing tension. That is experiencing shear. Okay. That's first first question. Second question. Now, gross area, net areas, and all that stuff, I need lengths and I need thicknesses. I need the thickness of what here? Flange. What is the flange thickness for a W8 by 24? Oh, you've got to break out the AISC 15th edition steel construction manual that everybody brought. We were doing so good. Mr. Keaton. All right, what is it? 0 0.4. 0 0.4. So, oh, I'll put this over here. For a W8 by 24, the flange thickness is 0 0.4 inches. But also, we're going to need A992 steel because in order to compute the capacity, we need a bunch of FYs and FUs all over the place. So, we're going to need that. Excuse me. Bless you. So that's that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Sound good? Alright. Now, let's look at a single block. Okay, let's start off with the gross area in shear, okay? Now, you told me that this long path was the one experiencing shear, and you are correct. How long is that total path? 11 inches. 11 inches. Now, think, here's the section, right? So, it's a, this is the path that we got to rip through. It's 11 inches long. How thick is it? What's that? Point, point 0.4, point 0.4, not point 0.04, point 0.4. So 11 inches times 0 0.4 inches is, I don't know, what is it, 4.4? 4. 4. 4. 4.4 square inches. So help me out. If that's the gross area in shear, what about the gross area in tension? What's that? It's not 0.4 times 11. It's 0.4 times what? One and a half. Exactly. This isn't so bad, is it? It's, it's the same principles as before. Now, if you actually look at the equation, the gross area in tension does not pop up, pop up at all. But in order to compute the net area in tension, you need 
the gross area intention, so you might as well compute it all anyways. All right. Everybody with me on this? Now, before we go into net area, I do want to bring one other thing up. We have three quarter inch diameter bolts. Or actually here, um, you can say three quarter inch diameter bolts. Actually, I don't like that symbol because we confuse that with um, fee sometimes. So diameter bolts. So the whole diameter is seven eighths of an inch. Let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. All right. So far, so good. Now, in order to compute the net area, so let's take the net area in shear first. So in order to compute the net area in shear, we take the gross area in shear and we subtract the appropriate number of bolt holes. Now, what's the area of a bolt hole? Before we, it's just the, the diameter of the bolt and the thickness. The diameter of the hole times the thickness. It's the diameter of the hole, not the hole. Yeah. But you're but you're right. Now, here's a six four thousand dollar question. How many bolt holes do we subtract for the gross area in shear to get the net area in shear? No, not not no. We're looking. At, remember, we're looking at this path, not that. One. But but okay. You're saying four. Is everybody else saying four? So continue that thought out. One point five plus a quarter. Not one point five. How many holes do we do we subtract along this path? Is what I'm asking. One. Two, three, and a half. Because it's along this path, right? This is the shear path, right? The net area in shear is the gross area in shear minus the area lost due to the bolt holes. Along that vertical path, we lose one, two, three, and a half. So it's 3.5. Does that make sense? We're saying technically it breaks in the middle of a bolt hole. Exactly, yes. So, it, hold on, let's test it before we do any math. What's the formula for the net area in tension? The gross area in tension minus how many bolt holes? Half. A half a bolt hole, exactly right. Now remember, that's just for a single block. We're going to multiply by four at the end, right? Because we've got four blocks we've got to go through. So, the net area in tension is the gross area in tension minus 0 0.5. <coughs> Does that make sense? I, I, I don't want to move past this until it does. I mean, I really, I, I mean, this is, this is key, so. If it's, if, if we're saying that it's breaking through the middle of the hole. Yes. So, vert, vertically we're saying that even though it's breaking up the middle, that's, that's an entire hole. So why is it like if it's well, wait, if this wait. way it's an entire hole, but this way it's no, what was hole. the first thing you said? You said vertical. I don't like going that way. I'm yeah, we're we're ripping through all of this, right? So if you're counting counting the holes that way, it's like one, two, three, and then so why is the half the last one considered a half because it's not going all the way through? You, you see what I'm saying? Like okay. we're breaking a half. So here's your failure block. All right, so actually, no, let me do it the other way. So your failure block sort of looks like this. It looks like that. So that's an entire bolt diameter, an entire bolt diameter, an entire bolt diameter. But that's not an entire bolt diameter. It's only half of one. Does that make sense? So, for the tension, it's the tire length minus just a half, not a whole one. Does that make sense? This is important stuff. Everybody good? Okay. Now, I need some values. What's A and B going to be? And let's be a little specific with this. Let's go to like three decimal places.
3.175 on the first one. Do I have a second on that? Yes. And on the second. Zero point four two five. Do I have a second on that? All right. Okay. If you understand that, then everything else I'm about to do is just mechanics at this point. It's going to be pretty boring. So UBS is also 1.0. I'll go ahead and write that down. Okay. Now, we're looking at a single block. UBS, F-U-A-N-T, plus 0 0.6, F-U-A-N-V, all right, so 1, 65 KSI, times 0 0.425 inches squared plus 0 0.6 times the minimum of 50 KSI um, 4.4. KSI times 3.175. Okay, now help me out with something just so I can keep this math kind of simple. Let's do this first one. What is 1 times 65 times 0.425? Can somebody just tell me this, this part right here? Kips plus 0 0.6 times the minimum. Oh, goodness. Is um, so let's do each one. So what's 50 times 4.4 and 65 times 3.175? Do each one separately. So what's the first one? 50 times 4.4. I think I can do that one in my head. That's what, 220? So this is 220, and what are the units? That's KSI times inches squared, so it's kips. And then 65 times 35.175. So we'll say, like what, 206.4? All right, so what are we going to do? So 27.6 plus 0.6 times what? It's the minimum, it's the smallest one. So 27.6 plus 0.6 times that lower one equals what? Hmm? What'd you get? 132. 132? I got a different, I got 151.4. 151.45. Okay. We'll say one. Did you get that? No, the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, so that's this. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. Now, is that our answer? Got to multiply by four, but is that our answer? The 
V value. Don't forget that. So Rn, so here, I'm running out of room here, and I don't want to squinch this. So let me go on to the next page. Does everybody have this? So for, so Rn for one block is 151.4 kips. Rn for the whole cross section is four blocks. Because if, if Mr. Maroon's trying to rip this out and he's trying to grab this, he needed four hands, right? Because he had to grip four different flanges to do it. So four times 151.4 kips is it's like what, 605.6? 6? Yeah. 605.6 kips. But remember, that's a nominal capacity. It has not yet been adjusted by the safety factor. VRN is very easy to forget. Okay, it's really, after all that stuff we just did, it's really easy to go, oh, I forgot V. So don't forget that. So 0 0.75 times 605.6. And that equals what? Four fifty four point two kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay, so that's the answer. So what do I what am I what am I getting at? Let's recall from example four. Okay, this member had a gross section yielding capacity of 318.6 tips and a net section fracture of 255.6. So now what we can do is we can add to that and we can say it's block shear rupture capacity is 454.2 kips. Because now we're comparing apples to apples. These are all nominal capacities that have been adjusted by their appropriate resistance factors. Now, comparing apples to apples, what can you tell me about block shear rupture compared to the others? You don't have to worry about it. Exactly right. Um, the net section fracture capacity, so when we did it before, we had gross section yielding and net section fracture. When we were just looking at these two numbers, we said, well, this is going to occur well before that one, so this is the capacity of the section. But we hadn't checked block shear, so we weren't really sure. Now that we've checked block shear, we found block shear wasn't a problem. But it very well could have been, right? We start changing the connection layout or use a different section, and this 454 could very easily drop to 200 or something. Like, for instance, we had, what, four bolts per line? What if it was only three bolts per line? Now the block that looked like this suddenly now looks like that. So now it's a lot smaller, right? Make, make sense? So you don't really know whether or not it's going to govern until you just check it. So you kind of have to check all three. So on your homework assignment, let me pull that up real quick so that everybody's sort of on the same page with that. Um, here's homework three. So, problem number one, you just have to do a design and you can ignore block shear. I'm not worried about block shear on problem number one. Problem number two, all I want you to do is I want you to look at this angle and I want you to tell me what its block shear capacity is. Okay? And I have a point I'm going to make about this and I hopefully you'll read between the lines on that. Um, lines, lines of bolts. Uh -huh. um, but I have an angle here, I want to determine the block shear capacity. Now I say design block shear capacity, so don't forget about factoring. And what we did on this problem where we computed the capacity of a single block and multiplied by four to get the total number of blocks, that doesn't necessarily apply here. You've got to use your, use your noggin and make sure that you're, you're doing this appropriately. Problem number three, I have a channel and I do want you to consider all three. I want you to consider gross section yielding, net section fracture, block shear rupture. You can't really design for block shear rupture. What you've got to do is you've got to pick a section and then just check gross section yielding, net section fracture, block shear rupture. 
to see whether or not it works. So block shear is going to be the very last thing that you do on this section to make sure it works. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to go and pick the next one. So that's just uh, the name of the game. Sound good? All right. Remember, the last thing I want to say is use the thumb analogy. So if I was going back to this problem, like let's look at the thumb analogy and let's look at this from a math perspective. Look at this right here. I've got two shear areas, one tensile area. So there's a lot of A, G, B on this problem, a lot of A and B. Whereas over here, it's only one shear path. So this path has half as much shear resistance as this one. And to counter that, it's just a bit more tensile resistance. So if I was looking at block shear, what do you think is the most likely failure path? Left or right? The right, because there's, you're just ripping through less steel. Okay. So what's the easiest thing to happen? The one on the right. So you could look at both paths and compute a block shear capacity for each one, and I could tell you the one on the right would govern every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Just because of the dimensions, you're ripping through less steel. Like think, if this is like 8 inches long, your gross area in shear is 16 inches times the thickness, whereas here it's just 8 inches times the thickness. Does that make sense? Right. Any questions on that? Or on homework, anything in general? Okay. With that, uh, I want to uh, now deviate a bit. We've got plenty of time to talk about this. I want to talk about the Hyatt Region C walkway collapse. I started to talk about this a little bit last time, uh, but I want to give it its due discussion in here today. So to date, this is the worst structural failure in American history uh, when a structure was subjected to its design load. So again, I'm, I'm not, this is a little bit different than what happened um, on 9-11 or what happened uh, during, let's say, the Oklahoma City bombing. Because those were extreme events. Those structures were subjected to loads that were far outside their day-to-day -day experiences. This was not the case here. This structure and this element was experiencing a load that it was designed for. Right? It was designed to hold up this load, um, and it failed under it. And under its, in its design load, this is the worst structural failure in American history. There were 114 people that were killed and 185 people that were injured. And to give you kind of an idea of the gravity of what we're talking about here, so this was in a Hyatt Regency hotel in Kansas City um, in the early 80s. Um, what would happen is, if you've ever been in a, 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 ho a large hotel in a, in a major uh, metropolitan city, I mean, they're used for a lot more than just checking in guests and, uh, and, and rolling bags to the, to the elevators. They use these for all sorts of different events, and you'll have weddings there, you'll have parties there, and you name it. And so they used to have these like cocktail tea parties and whatnot uh, on the weekends. This happened during a Friday evening. This was, you know, like uh, uh, sort of the, the, the nightlife extraordinaire, if you will. And so there was a big to-do going on. There were hundreds of people in the building. And so the way that the, the hotel lobby was structured, there's the, the, the ground floor where, you know, people are drinking and dancing and having a good time. And then there's these two elevated walkways, okay? Um, so here's the, here's the building. There's just two elevated walkways. And they're sort of like these platforms looking over the, the, uh, the, the party. So, I mean, there's a lot of people on them. This was a, I mean, it was a really cool area. Uh, well, what happened was the way that the, the, the support system worked, like here's the ceiling, okay? And you had these threaded rods coming down, and you had a walkway, and then you had another set of threaded rods, and you had another walkway. Okay. Well, what happened was the threaded rods up here, particularly this connection right there, it failed. Like if you look at this diagram up here on the top right, this is what the connection looked like. Um, you can see these threaded rods sort of going through like that. Well, what happened after? was they it ripped through. And so not only did this walkway collapse, but the people that were on this walkway, it fell, and then the walkway fell on top of them. So they were sandwiched in between, you know, multi-inch thick slabs of concrete falling on top of them. So this was not a good day. This was, this was horrible. Um, and what it all boiled down to was a change in the connection design from engineer to contractor. See, the engineer came in, that they did not design the connection this way. 
What they designed was a single threaded rod. So this is how it was built. This is how they designed it. They designed a single threaded rod that extended through both stories and the walkways were suspended on that single rod. The rod was actually fine. It wasn't the rod that failed. What happened was, if you looked at the connection where the rods uh, went through that channel beam, it basically doubled the shear load on that box beam. And so the rod just sheared right through that section. And I mean, everybody was, 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 uh, uh, was drastically injured or killed as a result. But hey, the contractor saved like 10 bucks a connection. I mean, that, that's why it happened. The contractor just looked at it and said, well, I can save some money on this. If I, instead of having to deal with this super long threaded rod, I'll just cut them in half and drill two. It'll be all right. And it wasn't. Okay. So if anything, this should tell you the importance of communication. This isn't a joke. I mean, this was, I don't mean to be melodramatic or, or bring doom and gloom into this scenario, but I do think it's kind of important to bring uh, together a bit of reality as to what we're talking about. I mean, a lot of people died this day. This was, this was not a good day. Pretty much every engineer that even touched this job lost their license and all sorts of lawsuits. So how did the engineers lose their license if it was the contractor's fault? Liabilities, failure to communicate, failure to monitor during construction, you name it. I mean, just... And, and, and go tell that to the 114 families, you know what I mean? It, it, yeah, it, 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 it falls pretty flat, you know. So, um, okay, so what I want to do today is I want to talk about the threaded rod design. Threaded rods are still, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a threaded rod. They're still perfectly viable tension members. In fact, they're probably some of the most efficient tension members that you find in structural systems as they serve to tension a structure together and serve to brace it under... Uh, under lateral events. Um, they can be used for diagonal bracing. They can also be used as sort of sag rods to prevent excessive deflection. So if you have an element that's deflecting a lot, you can put in uh, vertical rods to sort of prevent that element from sagging too much. So they're very, very common uh, in that instance. Uh, if you look at typically available bar diameters, like if I go down to Home Depot or to Huntington Steel or to a service center, um, I'm typically going to find a, a round bar in anywhere from quarter inch to one quarter inches in about an eighth of an inch increment. So I can go and buy three eighths, a quarter, or three eighths, a half, five eighths, you know, so on and so forth, in one eighth inch increments. But then once I get past a one and a quarter, it jumps up to four inch increments. So don't try and spec like a two and three eighths inch bar because you're not going to find that typically available. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Now, one of the things you will find about... Um, threaded bar design is that typically the way that it works is you have a round bar and the threads are cut into it. So the net area is always less than the gross area. Okay. And you think, when would the net area ever be greater? Well, it would be if you had an upset rod. So an upset rod is when the end is actually thicker and the threads are cut into this thicker section. That's what we call an upset rod. But upset rods are very, very uncommon, and so typically your net area is always going to be uh, smaller than the gross area. Now the capacity is very, very simple. It's just the, the nominal tensile stress of the rod times the area. Um, we're actually not going to use the equation in this format. We're going to retool it and make it a, a lot more user friendly for us uh, as tension member designers. I'm expressing it in this format because if you notice, this equation comes from chapter J. Chapter J is the chapter on connections. And so literally right after this, we're going to be talking about bolted connections and welded connections. So I kind of want to introduce you a bit to uh, uh, connection you know, notation because we are going to be experiencing it very, very soon. We're going to be starting bolted connections on Wednesday, so just based on timing. Now, so what we have to do, what we have to determine is phi nt, or we have phi f nt a b. Okay, so here's what we've got. Phi is going to be 0 0.75 f nt a b. So we have to determine two things. What's our nominal tensile stress and what's our area of the bar? Now the area of the bar, I'll go ahead and tell you, just pi over 4 d squared, just the cross-sectional area. Um, what I want everybody to do is I want everybody to turn to table J3.2 on page 16.1-129 because I do want to expose you to this table because we're going to use it quite a bit. Okay, 
Now, I'll give everybody a second turn to this. This is important. Everybody's taking it. Um, I don't know that you necessarily need to tab this. I have this entire section tab, the section J3, because we're going to be kind of referring to a good bit of stuff in here. But it's not totally necessary, but, but I do. Um, this is a, a really, really um, uh, critical table in the spec that indirectly uh, drives a lot of what we do with bolted connections. So here's an example. Okay, Here's a plate. Here's another plate. Here's a bolt. Step through those plates to bolt them together. Sound good? And so I have a structure, and I take this and I yank on it. So what's the bolt experience? Shear, right? I'm shearing the bolt. Make sense? Now, if you look at that table, you'll look and you'll see, see on the left how there's things like group A and group B and stuff like that? Now, I'll explain what that means and whatnot later. But if you look, you've got different rows for whether or not the threads are included or whether or not the threads are excluded. Does everybody kind of see that? So the idea is if I've got plate A and I've got plate B and I'm drilling through them and here's the plates, and I'm yanking on it, am I shearing through the bolt threads or not, right? And so obviously that would matter if I'm trying to determine how strong that bolt is, am I shearing through the threads or not? But we're not shearing, we're just yanking in tension. So like for instance, if you look at group A, there's two rows associated with group A. The shear capacities are different, but the tensile capacities are not, right? Because it doesn't matter whether or not the threads are included or excluded in shear, because in tension, you're not shearing it. You're just yanking on it. So the tensile capacity doesn't change. Does that make sense? And so what you should see is a there's an A307 at the top, which we largely ignore. We don't really use those for structural capacity. Um, and then we have a group A, group B, group C, and then there's that, right? Everybody see that? Now, if you look over here on the left, the nominal tensile capacity, nominal tensile capacity, it doesn't change whether or not the threads are included or excluded. And so the nominal tensile stress of threaded parts that are not bolts, so, that, so that's what those lower rows are for, everything that's not a bolt. Um, the tensile strength is 0.75 Fu. So what we have here is, so we have FNT, sorry, FNT. And so we have V, F, N, T, A, B. V is 0.75, and F, N, T that is that. Does that make sense? So that's why over here, the capacity is that there's a 0.75 square. One of them is the V value. One of them is the, um, the, the reduction from the tensile strength uh, from, from F, U to F, N, T. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. Now we're running out of time, uh, but I want to. Don't worry. We'll have a clear example of this later. But a couple things I'll mention. We do not deal with slenderness uh, because it's a slender rod. We don't have to consider that. And then what we can do, and I'll walk through this later. It's really not that bad. But if we have 0.75 fu or 0.75 squared fu ab. And AB is pi over 4 times the diameter squared. In design mode, all I care about is the diameter. So I can do a little bit of algebra and retool this and come up with a really, really, really simple expression for threaded rod design. And trust me, it is very, very simple. We're going to test that on this problem. This is what we're going to do next time. Suspended walkway, very similar to the higher regency, and we're going to compute uh, and design a threaded rod to support that walkway. And after that, that is exam one in a nutshell, and then we go into exam two. Sound good? That's all I got, everybody. We'll see you on Wednesday.